hi, and welcome to ABCAM's first IHC webinar. Uh, today I'll be discussing immunohistochemistry. And for those of you who are not familiar with this technique, I'm going to go over what it is, how to um, perform this application, and then finally some common problems that researchers might encounter and how to solve them. So first off, what is immunohistochemistry? Well, immunohistochemistry is a technique used to study microscopic anatomy. Tissues are sliced into very thin sections and then um, mounted to a slide. They can be then observed under the microscope. Here we're looking on the left at a mouse liver tumor with um, pan keratin staining in brown. And as you can see, um, you, can, you can easily see this distinction, um, very distinct stain and um, localized to the area of protein expression. So this technique allows researchers to study protein expression and localization, and is widely used in basic and clinical research. So how did uh, immunohistochemistry come about? Well, IHC is a variation of histochemistry. This is a technique used by histologists to examine tissue morphology. Uh, with, hi uh, with histochemistry, the stains are um, much more general. So here. Um, the common stain used is hematoxylin and eosin. Hematoxylin will non-specifically um, stain uh, nuclei, a blue color, and the eosin will counterstain the cytoplasmic regions uh, with a pink or reddish stain. While this is a great technique to observe tissue structure and abnormalities, the stain does not distinguish among proteins, so there's no specific information about what's going on in the tissue. In order to get around this issue, immunohistochemistry was developed. And using specific antibodies, IHC can distinguish among proteins. So here we're looking at a tumor biopsy section, and this is bone marrow. And here in the brown, you see a stain for um, the protein WENT1. And of course, this is a hematoxylin counterstain uh, for the nuclei. So clearly, you can see that um, the protein is expressed in um, portions of the tissue, but not in um, the whole tissue. So you get this local information that you don't get from histochemistry. So now I'd like to go into um, how immunohistochemistry is performed. I'm going to divide this into two main elements. The first is sample preparation. This will involve a fixation of the tissue, embedding it in a matrix so that it can be um, sectioned, and then finally um, antigen retrieval. The next element that I'll discuss is the actual IHC protocol. I'm going to go into blocking what it is and why it's important. Um, incubation with the primary antibody that will target your protein of interest, incubation with a secondary antibody, which will be specific for the primary antibody, and this allows um, ultimately for your detection. Uh, then I'll go through um, adding an enzyme substrate, so for enzyme conjugated secondaries, this is going to be a very important step, and then finally cover slipping and observation. So let's first begin with the sample preparation. Collectively, these steps are referred to as histotechnique. This includes fixation, embedding, and sectioning. So now I'll begin with fixation. So the point of fixation is to preserve post-mortem um, structure and composition of um, a living tissue. And there are two main approaches. Um, one can use a cross-linking reagent, such as paraformaldehyde, or an organic solvent, such as acetone, methanol, or ethanol. So first I'd like to describe the cross-linking based fixative, and um, these involve the use of formaldehyde or some variation of it. The two most common fixatives are um, a formalin, which is an aqueous solution of formaldehyde in water. This is prepared um, as a 10% uh, solution. Uh, the one disadvantage to this type of fixation is that this, as the solution ages, um, methanol is formed as a byproduct. And this can result in a clumping of the tissues um, instead, or the clumping of the proteins rather, instead of um, cross-linking. Uh, and this would present a problem when you go to try to um, actually stain with your antibody of interest. The other type of formaldehyde-based fixative is uh, paraformaldehyde, and this is a polymer of formaldehyde. It's used as a 4% solution, and it has the same fixing compa capacity as a 10% um, formalin solution. Uh, in this case, you do not uh, have methanol as a breakdown product, so this is considered to be a methanol-free fixation method. So these formaldehyde-based fixatives are actually um, very, very useful, and they 
preserve tissue morphology um, very well. The main disadvantage is that the cross-linking of proteins can sometimes prevent the antibody from recognizing the um, epitope or your protein of interest. And uh, I will discuss later how we can get around this problem. So after fixation, the tissues need to be further processed by embedding and sectioning them. So in terms of embedding, the structural detail um, by infiltration with a matrix. So this is typically paraffin. Uh, paraffin wax is used. The tissues are dehydrated in sequential baths of ethanol and xylene, and they're finally infiltrated with the molten paraffin wax. Once this wax has um, hardened, the tissues are cut into thin sections for optimal resolution and transmission of light. The sections are typically about five microns thick. Another type of um, tissue processing, instead of going through a, a um, cross-linking fixation and then embedding, uh, is freezing the tissue. Freezing can preserve the tissue without any com chemical modification. Uh, the one disadvantage to this is that ice crystals can form upon freezing, and this can damage the morphology of the tissue. So this is uh, usually addressed by transferring the tissues to a 20% sucrose solution, and the sucrose here acts as a cryoprotectant. So following um, that step, the tissue can now be um, snap frozen, and this is um, this occurs rather um, in a bath of isopentene on dry ice. This will provide an optimal temperature for quickly freezing the tissue to minimize damage. Uh, at this point, the tissues are then embedded in a gel, usually OCT, and cut in a cryotone. This is then followed by a fixation with an organic solvent such as acetone. Uh, methanol and ethanol can also be used. And uh, these function to uh, fix the tissue by um, dehydration and precipitation. So at this point, these frozen tissues are ready to undergo the IHC protocol. But going back to our paraffin embedded sections, these will still require further processing. The slides must be deparaffinized and rehydrated. Because the paraffin wax can interfere with um, the actual um, staining of the tissue with the antibody, it must be removed completely. This is accomplished by applying serial sections, uh, serial incubations rather, of clean xylene. Um, this is followed by uh, multiple washes in ethanol and gradually bringing the tissue to an aqueous solution of distilled water. The final step in preparing these paraffin embedded sections is antigen retrieval. So as I mentioned before, with the cross-linking um, fixative of form formalin or um, PSA, the cross-links can sometimes mask the epitope. So to reverse these cross-links, we use a technique called antigen retrieval. This is also known as epitope retrieval or demasking. And the two most common methods of antigen retrieval are a heat-induced retrieval as well as an enzymatic retrieval. In heat-induced retrieval, the sections on the slides are heated in a buffer. And there are two main buffers, um, the first being a sodium citrate buffer at a low pH of 6, or a tris EDTA buffer, and this is at a higher pH of 9. So Sections um, in the solutions are then heated, and this is accomplished either in a pressure cooker, some people use a vegetable steamer, um, additionally, a microwave or autoclave um, have also been used. The next type of retrieval is enzymatic retrieval, and in this case, the tissues are actually incubated with an enzyme such as trypsin, pepsin, or protonase K. And this will al also function to reverse crosslinks and make the epitope more accessible.